good morning. Here are her part two of lecture 22 of CENG 3325 structural analysis. And this is going to be a short video covering uh, the theory of approximating deflected shapes. So I want to look at approximating deflected shapes in uh, frames, beams, etc. And we've already covered this, uh, maybe not explicitly, but we have uh, baked a lot of these topics into many of our previous discussions. So I want to look at approximating deflected shapes. So it is good to have a basic knowledge of how things will deform. So if I want to know how something is going to deform, how can I do that? Uh, even without doing any calculations, how can I know how something is going to deform? Well, um, so again, we would like to know, uh, would like to have methods, even sans any calculation. Um, of predicting deflected shape without calculations. So mo most of this is going to be fairly intuitive, um, but uh, maybe some of it will be more, but especially for more complex systems, it may not be. Uh, shape without calculations. So, for example, here. Um, in other words, if I, now, for example, I have drawn many beams before. Um, for example, a simply supported beam. I have drawn beams before and shown a point load here and shown that the deflection looks like this. That is what I mean when I say approximating deflected shape. I can predict how this thing is going to behave even before I do any kind of uh, calculation. So how do I do that? Now, for something this simple, that's fairly intuitive, that's fairly obvious, but for things more complex, uh, we need to look a little bit deeper. So uh, let's talk about the constraints on deflected shapes. Constraints on deflected shapes. So the first one is going to be supports. On cases where you have supports, well, um, fundamentally the keys the keys here are going to be pin and roller, and or the two cases we need to look at are pin and roller and fixed. Uh, pins and rollers are not, the, of course, the exact same thing. We've known that since statics class. But in terms of deflected shapes, they have the same effect on a beam or frame. So a pin or roller, a pin or roller, at this location, the deflection is going to be zero. Well, I, I suppose I could, if I'm looking at beams, it would be uh, I could say deflection is zero because that would be only vertical loads. But I guess the different I could say the difference between a pin and a roller is that uh, at a pin the x and y deflection is zero. At a roller, only the y deflection is zero. Only the deflection perpendicular to the surface is zero. That sort of thing. But a fixed support, and we've talked about this when we looked at uh, boundary conditions for shear and moment diagrams and flow deflection. Uh, for a fixed support, the uh, deflection and rotation is zero. The deflection and rotation is zero. So for example, if we have a, a beam, for example, a cantilever beam, here, this is a fixed support. So when I apply a point load P, the deflection has to go something like this. Or the deflected shape has to look something like this. At the left end where the fixed support is, I have, the, I have both a deflection and a rotation, or a deflection and a slope that are both equal to zero. The, the, uh, the uh, fixed support, by definition, prevents deflection and it prevents rotation. 
uh, something that like a simply supported beam, something like a simply supported beam here, I apply a point load P here and I get a deflected shape like this. Um, I, I know that it will have no deflection at these points, um, but I, uh, I am free to apply whatever rotation is necessary to make the beam work. However, where this gets really interesting is where we have statically indeterminate beams. What if I have a beam with multiple spans? So for example, something like this here. What if I have a statically indeterminate beam like this and I apply a point load P here? Well, let's consider our constraints on our deflected shape. Let's consider the constraints on our deflected shape. Uh, one, I'm gonna have I must have zero deflection at the joints, or sorry, at the supports. At each of these points, I basically have uh, several known points. I'm going to have zero uh, deflection here. So, and uh, also at the pin in the roller, there cannot be a sudden, they're not gonna be, uh, because there's no uh, constraint on the rotation, I can't have sudden changes in curvature there. Um, so, in other words, I can't have a deflected shape. I know I'm not gonna have a deflected shape that looks something like this. I can't have a deflected shape that looks something like this. That might be tempting, but I know I can't have that. And the reason for it is I don't have any loads on the ends here to drive each of these segments down. And the curvature at a, uh, a uh, basically a pin or roller should not cause a discontinuity. Um, basically a pin or roller does not cause, and actually really both of these uh, neither pins nor rollers, uh, neither causes a discontinuity in beat deflected shape. We have seen this when we have looked at uh, when we have looked at functions of deflection and rotation. Uh, we know that uh, point loads will cause discontinuities in the. Uh, in the shear in a beam, uh, or the load function of a beam, so when the cell phone decided to start talking, um, that's okay. Uh, we can work with that. Uh, so, uh, but the, uh, and if we have a couple, that can cause discontinuity in the moment function, but the deflection of a beam should never have a discontinuity in it. The rotation in a beam should never have a discontinuity in it. Uh, the only way that can happen is if your beam is absolutely failing or if there's a change in geometry. Again, a discontinuity in deflection would look something like this. This is what a discontinuity in, in say, like a I-beam or sorry, a wide flange beam would look like. A discontinuity in uh, deflection for a wide flange shape would look something like this, where there's literally a jump from one flange to the next. And uh, real beams don't, don't behave this way. Uh, that's simply not possible unless the thing is fracturing in two. Or if I was looking at, def at, a, at a deflection in um, slope, my beam would end up looking something like this. At some point where there was that discontinuity, my uh, change in slope would have, a, just my slope would have a sharp change and it would just magically just bend down and just have a sharp discontinuity like this here. And we know that real beams do not behave like this. The moment function and the shear function can have discontinuities, but the actual deflected shape that this kind of thing is what's happening with this deflected shape here. So I know that is no good. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say, okay, well, I know I'm going to have something like that here. Uh, so the mid span should be going into positive bending. There's a direct, there's a positive load above it, so it makes sense that that's go that that is going into positive um, deformation or sorry, going into positive bending. And since I can't have any sudden changes in beam's geometry. Uh, I can't. I can't have it reverse direction. Therefore, the only way that's going to make sense is if the, I go into negative bending and then eventually come back to my zero deformation. Same thing here. So, on a multi-span continuous beam, I will have positive bend. If I have a point load in the middle, I will have positive bending in the interior span, 
and negative bendings on the edge spans or the, ex the exterior spans. And again, this comes down to the fact that deflection and rotation must be continuous. As long as it's the same beam all the way across, deflection and rotation must be continuous. Okay, so what happens if we combine support conditions? What happens if we looked at combined support conditions? What if I put a, a fixed support and then uh, in addition to that, I make it statically determinate by adding a roller somewhere along the ends. Well, if I apply a point load P like this here, let us look at what kind of constraints I must have on this. Well, I know at the left end of this beam, both the deflection and the rotation must be equal to zero. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw a big old horizontal line there because I know the slope at that point has to be zero. And I know at this point here that, this, that the deflection has to equal zero. So I don't know, you know, again, uh, wh whatever that function does, whether it goes like this or it goes like this, uh, the def the, that deflected shape must go through that point there. So my constraints on this are that I have to have a zero slope here and a zero deflection here and a zero deflection here. And other uh, constraints uh, would be something like this. I know that my deflection here has to be downward. It would not make any sense at all if the only location of a, po of a downward load had upward deflection. That would simply make no sense. Uh, that just doesn't even pass the smell test. So um, I'm going to have to, so the deflected shape that would make sense here um, would be something kind of like this. I would have negative bending. I would go through zero deformation here. And then at some point, I would maybe have an inflection point, And then maybe I'd come back down to this here. Something like that um, would be possible. Um, maybe something like that. Or let's see, I could I do this. Uh, I don't necessarily see that one. Um, maybe something like that. There's lots of different possibilities. Maybe I could draw it like this. No, there, that wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't want to bend like that. So um, again, something more like this. Something kind of like that, where you would have deflection here, and then we'd have an inflection point uh, here. So again, uh, for beams, our supports will tell us the approximate deflected shape. So you basically need to, again, this is an, appro this is an approximate method. There is no uh, hard and fast rule on this. Uh, rather, we're going to look at the uh, support conditions and then approximate the deflected shape. Now, for frames, the uh, joint support conditions, or sorry, the joint conditions are what becomes important. So for frames, the second thing we need to consider is joints, uh, joint of restrictions. And this is exceptionally important for frames. Again, this is exceptionally important for frames. So if you have a fixed support, or sorry, not a fixed support, a fixed joint, the rotation at that joint will be maintained. The rotation angle at that joint will be maintained. Uh, if you have a pin joint, however, uh, members must remain in contact. It's fairly uh, self-explanatory, uh, fairly intuitive, I hope. Uh, members must remain in contact, but their angle can change. But their relative angle can change. Uh, angle at the joint can change. So for example, let us consider a frame with uh, fixed supports. Uh, something like this. Let's just do fixed, fixed, fixed all the way around. So let's say I have a fixed support here and here and fixed joints. So when I say the angle must be maintained, what you really have to think about is that if this is at a right angle, regardless amount of the amount of load applied to this, this right angle is going to be maintained. So let's say I apply a point load P to the center here. Well, what's going to happen to this? 
Well, the mid span is probably going to want to go into positive curvature. The top span is going to want to go into positive curvature. So maybe something like this. Now the, jo the, the joints do not need to maintain their position. They're not supports. They can, they can move around in space. But notice here, in the deflected shape, they're going to maintain that right angle. So they start out at a right angle relative to each other, and they're going to end at a right angle relative to each other. The angle in a fixed joint is maintained. It was a right angle before. It is, a, it is a, at a right angle after. And because of our supports, because of our supports, um, we're going to end up with no rotation here. So I know the only way I can get from here to here without having any kind of discontinuity is to do something akin to almost like that. And this is greatly exaggerated deformation, of course. Oh, thank you. Uh, so basically, I, I would have an inflection point here and here. So I would have inflection points at some point along the column. So I would have inflection points here and here. Where the curvature change from, po where the moment change and moment and curvature change from positive to negative. So I would have a deflected shape like that. Um, or I could have, a, well, what if this was a simply supported beam, however? Or say, well, let's say I had fixed joints here. Or sorry, not fixed joints, uh, pin joints here. Now, I would want to make sure I had, a, maybe let's, let's just go ahead and give this, oh, fixed supports but pin joints. What's the, different, what's the difference going to be here? Well, in this kind of condition, The reason these things are bending is because moment is being transferred from the, the reason the columns are bending is because moment is being transferred from the, from the, uh, from the beam to the columns. But with these pin joints, moment cannot be transferred from the beam to the column. So instead, what's likely to happen is perhaps something like this. Maybe the, um, maybe the beam, the beam will go into bending but the columns will undergo mainly just axial deformation. So maybe they, under, maybe they would undergo a small amount of bending, but not very much bending. So maybe I could show maybe a tiny amount of bending, but very small amounts of bending. So uh, maybe they'd be, uh, maybe they go in a bit, maybe they go into a bit of bending from off axis axial loading, uh, from eccentric axial loading, but they would not go into any kind of large bending period. I could even probably just say they are just, I could even model them as saying, oh, they're under pure axial load. Uh, there is no bending moment being transferred through these. So again, they're not undergoing this kind of large deformation. They're largely just compressing axially, while the columns on this one would be going into, uh, would be going into a heavy amount of bending and curvature. So again, uh, we can predict the deflected shape of frames and beams using both the support conditions and the uh, joint uh, conditions uh, and the joint uh, restrictions. So uh, this is, of course, this is not an exact science, but it can be useful often um, to, before you even start with something, uh, before you even put pen to paper and start doing calculations to predict the deflected shape. And this can also be used to find, uh, this is also useful when doing, doing the force method to find uh, redundance uh, or to find uh, uh, indeterminate forms that we can get rid of. And we'll explore that more when we look at the force method on Thursday. All right, that'll do it for today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for uh, participating in class. Hope you learned a few things. Hope you all enjoyed this. And as always, thank you.